painting, uh, which already uh, is spectacular, uh, hard to live up to this morning's talks, good way to begin. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, I am fascinated by uh, viruses as physical objects. They are beautiful things. Viral diseases are uh, ugly and fatal in many, all too many cases. So uh, one of the many things about viruses that changed my professional life and got me started doing experiments and working in biology was learning that they can be made, infectious viruses can be made from purified components. Uh, it's a dream that won't be fulfilled, uh, the idea of creating life from scratch. Uh, viruses, for good reason, are arguably alive. Uh, they are simple enough to be reconstituted from purified components. Uh, I've evolved over the 10, 15 years I've focused on viruses to consider them uh, alive, whereas I had started insisting that they were inanimate objects that uh, we should study from a physical point of view. I want to emphasize uh, throughout this talk, the size of viruses. And I argue that uh, more than anything else, the size is a defining property of viruses. Uh, with apologies to high resolution structural biologists, uh, I think it's useful to state that all viruses are the same size. They're about 50 nanometers in diameter, modulo a factor of two, so a big virus is twice that, 100 nanometers. Uh, there aren't many viruses that big. A small virus is half that size. So uh, it's interesting already from a physical point of view why it's good for viruses to be as small as possible. Why can they have that small a range of sizes? It's because the range of the number of genes they have is relatively small. It goes from of order 10 to of order 100. When you take the cube root of that factor of 10 range, you get a factor of 2. And that's uh, what accounts for why viruses, which are protective protein shells with the, the viral genome in size, it's essentially packed at uh, close packing density. And so the volume of the virus scales with the length of the genome, and that's why uh, you have this factor of two only in the range of sizes. I want to talk more about why the size is what it is. For the history of viruses, it's significant. I'll come down here as soon as uh, so I'm not blocking the view. Uh, viruses were only discovered 100 years ago. You know the stories about Pasteur and uh, his treatment of uh, a seriously ill boy with rabies. Uh, he vaccinated the boy even after he was uh, sick. Uh, it's better to vaccinate before, but it, it helps even during. He didn't understand that he was vaccinating against a virus. He, he knew all about bacteria. Uh, but uh, even he didn't know the difference between rabies as a disease agent and viruses. Bacteria are microns in size. You can see them. So uh, viruses you can't see. Uh, you can see them since uh, less than 100 years ago. You, you need to have a better than uh, optical microscope. Even with super resolution today, you can't see something that's uh, 20, 30 angstroms, uh, uh, nanometers in size. So um, they weren't visible. And related to their small size, they weren't filterable. And what that means is the way people discovered Pasteur and others, Koch and their schools in the um, 19th century, the way they discovered new disease agents was to take uh, infected uh, bodily fluids, blood, pus, feces, take infected plant tissue and 
grind it up and pass it through a filter. Everything uh, small enough came through. The bacteria were left behind. You, you take what got caught in the filter and you try it out as a disease agent by infecting uh, a healthy organism with it and showing that the same symptoms develop. Uh, I want to talk about another consequence of the size of viruses, namely <coughs> that uh, this sounds like a non sequitur, but because they're as small as they are, uh, Crick and Watson in 1956 were able to conclude or predict that they should have high symmetry and icosahedral symmetry in particular. Proteins don't have symmetry, bacteria don't, we don't. We have approximate symmetries, but uh, thanks to I'm sorry? Uh, our approximate symmetries, our right-left symmetry. And yes. Uh, I mentioned already Koch and implied that uh, bacteriology uh, had the enormous success that it did in defining biology as a modern science in the 19th century. Uh, I would say one reason is because of these post postulates, which were applied in dozens to hundreds of uh, classical instances. The disease agent, the putative one, had to be found in infected uh, hosts in every instance of the disease. Uh, you purify it and grow it outside the host, and then you show that the uh, pure culture uh, is infectious. That work to uh, figure out cholera, dysentery, and a host of other bacterial uh, diseases, but not viral diseases. Uh, and I already suggested uh, one reason why, because you lost the disease agent coming through the filter. So I just outline here why this paradigm of uh, 19th century biology didn't work uh, for viruses. Uh, it's significant that viruses turn out to be obligate parasites. Bacteria can grow on their own in broth with food, but they also do well in a large range of parasites, uh, uh, parasitic hosts. Uh, viruses are inanimate objects when they're outside their host. Um, 1898 is the year when uh, the first animal virus was discovered. It's also the year that the first plant virus was discovered independently. Uh, this is a remarkable paper. Uh, if anybody's interested, uh, I'll, I'll, I scanned it. I'll send it to you. Uh, it's very uh, prescient. It's an example of people years ahead of uh, their contemporaries. Uh, and figuring out that they had to look at what came through the filter. They had to deal with the fact that the disease agent couldn't be grown in culture, but otherwise the modified Koch postulates worked. And uh, they remark that uh, in general, one should start looking at what comes through the filter. Uh, and then they conclude by saying that this brings up the thought that the causal agents of a large number of other infectious diseases, such as smallpox, cowpox, gives a list. I've circled the ones that aren't uh, viral diseases, uh, but after all, he was just uh, speculating that uh, many of these would turn out to be viral diseases. Smallpox, cowpox, they go back, vaccination against them, to the end of the 1700s when uh, Jenner figured out uh, that uh, women milking cows were immune from a smallpox epidemic. epidemic. It turns out that the cowpox for humans is an attenuated form, if you like, of the smallpox. Pasteur, 50 years later, was attenuating rabies to get vaccines for rabies, but wasn't clear, as they say, about the difference between a virus and a bacterial disease agent. Uh, it was more than 15 years later that Durrell uh, 
discovered viruses that infect bacteria. That's also a very inspiring and remarkable story, uh, which I'd love to talk with you about if you're interested. So just to make certain that everybody's clear what a virus is, uh, the simplest viruses are essentially just protected genetic information. Uh, viruses are exceptional in that of evolving organisms, and if you like, of living things, they're the only ones that have RNA as well as DNA, one or the other, as their genomes. In fact, most viruses have RNA genomes. Um, and one of the viral gene products is a protein that spontaneously, in an interesting self-assembly process, forms a protective shell for the virus genome and helps the virus get in and out of cells. We'll be hearing from Steve Harrison about viral entry. Um, the shells are most often spherical. It turns out they're specifically icosahedral. When they're not spherical, they're most often cylindrical. Or you have some combination of the two shapes. Bacterial viruses have a spherical head and a cylindrical tail. There are interesting reasons why only bacterial viruses have tails. Uh, the shells turn out to have many copies, but very special multiples of 60 copies of one gene product until you get to much larger capsids when you need two or more gene products to faithfully form the uh, high symmetry shell. So uh, this is my version of the paper by Crick and Watson in 1956. It's a two and a half page nature paper the two-and-a-half-page na Nature paper from the 50s that most of you know is the 1953 Watson and Crick paper. Uh, obviously a very important paper. Uh, from a, a theory point of view, uh, this 1956 paper predicting the icosahedral symmetry of viruses is uh, comparably remarkable. Uh, there's not a single equation in it, uh, no computer simulations either. Uh, some simple symmetry arguments, and more importantly, uh, before the genetic code, before even Crick knew about messenger RNA, they made the following argument. Um, well, here, let's, let's uh, go through these few lines. Uh, what was known then, for sure, uh, but not in high resolution, was uh, that viruses appeared to be spherical and they had a characteristic size of tens of nanometers in diameter. So if you take diameters in this range and you ask uh, uh, how many proteins would you have in the shell if you take a typical size protein of a few nanometers, uh, you would make an estimate that there are, uh, sorry, you take this range of uh, radii and calculate that you have on the order of hundreds of proteins making up the sh shell. Uh, now you ask how much volume is available inside for the genetic information. Uh, you can make an estimate of it. You ask if it's, uh, suppose you're thinking about RNA, but it would be the same for DNA. Uh, the maximum density is about a gram per cc. Uh, it's an order of magnitude estimate, so you see how many Daltons, or how many nucleotides of RNA you can fit inside, and you see that it's on the order of thousands, which means you can only have a few genes. So the first genomes sequenced were viral genomes. They're by far the shortest, so of course that would be the case. But before any were sequenced, it was uh, known that they had short genomes and therefore could only have a few genes. And so Crick and Watson argued one of the genes surely must code for the protein that forms the protective shell. And uh, you don't have enough room to code for many proteins. It can't even be that high molecular weight of protein. So you must have multiple copies of a relatively low molecular weight protein. Uh, and then the question was, how can you have as many of those proteins 
since they're identical proteins as gene products, uh, how can you have them as much as possible in the minimum energy uh, environment? In other words, you want them to have the same nearest neighbors, next nearest neighbors, and so on, to have the most uh, stable shell. And that raises the question, how many equivalent positions can you have on the surface of a sphere? Uh, turns out there's a maximum. It's not obvious, but it's 60. Uh, if you ask how many equivalent positions can you have on a circle, there's no limit. And that's why you have an infinite number of regular polygons. They can all be inscribed in a circle. You don't have an infinite number of regular perfect polyhedra. In fact, you know you have the five platonic solids, the largest of which is the icosahedron. So they argued that uh, icosahedral symmetry and 60 would be uh, the best situation for uh, capsid proteins. Uh, a few years later, uh, in a comparably uh, uh, impressive paper, Casper uh, and Klug addressed the problem, how can you have viruses of different sizes? Uh, 60 protein shells turns out to be the smallest shell you can have. In fact, there are hardly any viruses whose genomes are small enough to fit in a 60 protein shell, so you have to go to bigger ones. Again, you'd like to have an energetically stable capsid, so then you ask, as you form shells with icosahedral symmetry, what's the minimum number of inequivalent positions for the proteins forming the shell? And what they did was uh, some geometry, take a hexagonal lattice, you want to close it on itself. You need to introduce, this goes back centuries, sorry that Michael isn't here, he likes to uh, uh, go back centuries uh, to give credit. Uh, Michael, good, hi. Uh, in, the seven, in the 1700s, the great uh, mathematician was Euler, he did almost everything, and uh, one of the things he did was to show that to close uh, a, a hexagonal lattice on itself, you needed to introduce 12 five-fold disclinations. Um, and so what Kasper and Klug argued is that if you want to generate bigger and bigger shells that have icosahedral symmetry and the minimum number of inequivalent <coughs> positions for the single gene product forming the shell, then you take a walk on the hexagonal lattice, you take H steps in one lattice direction, K steps in the other, and you stop and you replace a hexagon by a pentagon. When you do that 12 times, you will not just have a closed shell, but you will have one that's icosahedrally symmetric. And they show that there's an infinite but discrete hierarchy of such shells, and uh, they're formed by all the possibilities for taking a non-negative integral number of steps along one direction, then similarly along the other. And uh, the number of inequivalent positions involved is given by uh, h squared plus k squared plus hk, and it turns out to be this special set of numbers. So the smallest shell uh, has 12 pentamers of proteins and 60 proteins. The next has 20 hexamers, and the next biggest has 30 hexamers. The next biggest has 60. It turns out that most viruses are accommodated, their genomes are accommodated by uh, these few structures. That's right, yes, in 62. Uh, it is interesting that the Crick and Watson 56 paper was accompanied, the next paper in Nature was a paper from Aaron Klug's group, uh, which suggested to them these uh, conclusions. Uh, just uh, before, in, in organizing this talk, I asked an undergraduate student, uh, uh, Leah Oster, uh, to uh, start collecting data on T numbers of uh, virals uh, capsids, 
and to organize them into groups, single-stranded RNA viruses and double-stranded DNA viruses. For single-stranded RNA viruses, uh, the overwhelming majority uh, are T equals 3 and T equals 4. For double-stranded DNA viruses, you have a very broad distribution, and look at the T numbers involved. Okay? I also asked her to just start collecting sizes of viral genomes organized according to whether they were single-stranded RNA or double-stranded DNA. And we quickly come to the uh, conclusion that RNA genomes are dramatically shorter than DNA genomes. Of course, there are exceptions in both directions. So I want to talk about some of the physical considerations that help you understand why that's so. Uh, and this, this way of thinking about viruses is, in fact, what organized a lot of our theory and experiment starting f 15 years ago. Uh, again, with apologies to David Baltimore and the standard and extremely useful classifications of viruses, we say there are two kinds. There are single-stranded RNA viruses and double-stranded DNA viruses. Of course, there are double-stranded RNA and single-stranded DNA, but the large majority of viral genomes are single-stranded RNA genomes, viruses, and of the others, the large majority of them are double-stranded DNA. So from now on, when I talk about RNA, I mean single-stranded RNA. When I talk about DNA, I'm talking about double-stranded DNA. Um, most uh, single-stranded RNA viruses uh, are plant and animal viruses. Uh, the majority of bacterial viruses are double-stranded. We'll come to possibly why that's so. Uh, RNA viruses involve a genome that is weakly confined. Related to that, it is spontaneously packaged in a co-self-assembly process when the RNA is in the presence of uh, the associated capsid protein. DNA viruses involve the genome being strongly confined, and in most cases, the genome is packaged into a preformed capsid, and a lot of work has to be done to do that. Uh, and that's because double-stranded DNA is a very different polymer as a physical object than single-stranded RNA. And I state it more dramatically here that a gene of DNA is a very different physical object than a gene of RNA. Uh, I'll not really be talking about enveloped viruses uh, except briefly at the end, uh, towards the end when I talk about our unsuccessful efforts to reconstitute from purified components and infectious uh, enveloped virus. Uh, Lambda has played such an important role in molecular biology, going back to the uh, 30s and 40s, and uh, the phages in general. Uh, let's look at some of the numbers characterizing its genome and its uh, <coughs> capsid. The genome is uh, almost 20 microns uh, long, Double-stranded DNA has a persistence length of 50 nanometers. <coughs> Means uh, when the molecule is thermally equilibrated, that's how far you can go along the backbone and still be headed in the same direction. Uh, the radius of the capsid is about 30 nanometers. And so it turns out that uh, to get this length of DNA into that smaller volume, you have to essentially close pack it with... Uh, an interaxial distance of about two and a half nanometers where you have very strong repulsions uh, between neighboring uh, duplexes of DNA. So the DNA is repelling itself strongly. It has also been strongly bent because all along its length, it's bent uh, into a smaller radius of curvature than thermal energy allows it to be. Um, what, what got us started uh, doing the experiments on viruses was theory I did with my old friend and collaborator, Avi Noam Ben Shaul. We s started asking questions about how it's possible to take a stiff self-repelling polymer like DNA and confine it in such a small volume. He's going to be talking about that later this afternoon. Uh, we calculated the, the work you have to do, the forces you need to apply to push the DNA into the preformed uh, empty shell, the pressures you build up, 
at about the same time, Carlos Bustamante and his group did a single molecule measurement of the forces involved in packaging. And uh, we designed uh, a poor man's version of that uh, bulk solution experiment where you measure directly the pressure built up rather than the forces applied uh, in packaging. Avinom will show this picture. It's a picture many of you know. Uh, it's an iconic uh, electron micrograph from uh, uh, the early 1960s. This is basically the DNA that had been confined in the head of this virus. Uh, you can tell the persistence length looking here. You'll never see a radius of curvature uh, smaller than 50 nanometers. Uh, so it's just emphasizing that the natural size, the radius of gyration of the DNA is significantly larger than its confinement size, and it's even smaller than the persistence length. DNA is a linear polymer. We know all the statistical physics of it, so we know how the radius of gyration, its size, is related to these two lengths, the contour length and the persistence length, and it's easy to understand what's going on uh, in this picture. Uh, we wanted to know how different would this picture look if you could see in an electron micrograph the RNA genome and uh, its capsid next to it, uh, especially because we had already at that point begun to do in vitro self-assemblies of viruses and virus-like particles by mixing capsid protein and the RNA genome. Uh, here's the picture. It's a cryo-electron micrograph. You have to keep the RNA uh, off a substrate so you can't do AFM or the usual electron microscopy. In fact, you need to have uh, holy grades where you have vitrified, thinly suspended uh, films, about 100 nanometers in thickness, so that uh, you don't get too much scattering of electrons by water. And with no contrast agent, uranyl acetate would kill the intrinsic secondary tertiary structure of the RNA. Uh, uh, you get one molecule at a time caught in the film. And we threw in some of the virus. This is the viral RNA. And you see that it's a very different picture from this. You see that, indeed, the thermally equilibrated genome occupies about the same volume as uh, it's confined in once you have the self-assembly of the capsid. Uh, these are RNA molecules, a little over 2,000 nucleotides long, one of the genes of uh, the plant virus we work on that's packaged uh, in the uh, virus particles I just showed you. Here's the same length of DNA. In fact, we do in vitro transcription to make the RNA molecules, and uh, this was the template. Okay? So in, in a sense, uh, it's obvious that DNA is an inefficient way, from the point of view of space, uh, for carrying genetic information, which is why uh, evolution had to think of all sorts of ingenious ways of compactifying the DNA, nucleosomes, and so on. Uh, because the RNA is weakly confined and uh, not pressurized uh, in its capsid, uh, you can co-self-assemble the virus by mixing the viral RNA with capsid protein. And we work with a virus whose capsid protein doesn't care what RNA it's given as long as the RNA is a reasonable size. So if you just have enough excess of capsid protein, you can completely <coughs> package any RNA, non-viral, uh, for that matter, synthetic anionic polymers with uh, comparable flexibility to single-stranded RNA. Um, for this particular capsid protein uh, for the plant virus CCMV, cowpea chloratic model virus, uh, we found what works best is to first mix the protein and the RNA in physiological buffer, so neutral pH and uh, 100 millimolar, little magnesium, little divalent cation, uh, and then lower the pH. And basically, uh, by lowering the pH, you're 
getting closer to the isoelectric point of the protein so that uh, uh, you can have stronger lateral attractions between the proteins. What's happening at neutral pH is that the protein is binding to the RNA. The N termini of the capsid proteins are arginine rich, so they're cationic. They bind, there are 10 cationic residues that bind to 10 nucleotides. And you saturate binding of the RNA at neutral pH, but you don't have capsids forming until you lower the pH enough to turn on strong lateral interactions between the proteins. And then you analyze what you've got in any number of ways. Uh, here, you've got the RNA. Uh, this is ordinary EM with negative stain. Uh, this is cryo-EM. It's hard to see, but in fact, there isn't much to see. You see the little blobs I showed you before of uh, equilibrated RNA. Now, still at neutral pH, you add capsid protein. Uh, but you don't have capsids. You just have RNA saturated by protein. Uh, you can actually see that uh, in the cryo-EM. Uh, and then you lower the pH, and you get uh, capsids. And we're always monitoring the size distribution. Um, this is the size distribution you see when you take the purified virus. There is always a little monodispersity, if you like, even though we know from high-resolution mass spec that you only have 180 proteins uh, in the capsid. But this is as good a capsid as you can form. It's indistinguishable from the uh, purified virus. Turns out you have hysteresis. Once you form the capsids, you can raise the pH again. Even though you're weakening the lateral interactions between the proteins, uh, the capsids remain intact. It's very useful for the virus because it has to survive in many different uh, pH environments. Um, This is a negative stain electron micrograph of a reconstituted infectious virus. Namely, we take the viral RNA molecules and we mix them with uh, capsid protein and go through this uh, self-assembly protocol I described. So uh, this particular virus was reconstituted from purified components in the 1960s. Uh, it was the second virus to be reconstituted from scratch. The first one was TMV, tobacco mosaic virus. Uh, TMV is the first on many lists. It was the first virus discovered, along with hoof and mouth disease at the same time. It was famously the first virus crystallized in the 1930s. And 20 years later, in the 50s, it was the first virus reconstituted from purified capsid protein and viral RNA. It took a dozen years before the next virus was reconstituted from purified components. That's CCMV. And there have been a few other examples since. Okay. Uh, but we work with the CCMV capsid protein because we're interested in spherical virus-like particles uh, for many reasons. <coughs> and it turns out that this capsid protein uh, is the least discriminating of the RNA that you give it. And we would like to package and protect non-viral RNA molecules for gene delivery and other purposes. And we'd like to be able to reconstitute those virus-like particles outside the cell from purified components. Um, if you take much shorter RNA, you still get uh, the same T equals three capsids, but you have many copies of the RNA inside. Uh, if you take much longer RNA, you still get T equals three capsids, but they share two or more, uh, each molecule shares two or more uh, capsids. So you have what we call multiplets. So it's clear that the capsid protein strongly prefers to aggregate in two dimensions with a certain curvature, okay? That's the evolution of the virus, to have its RNA preferentially packaged. Plus, of course, there are specific bits of secondary tertiary structure in the viral RNA that have high affinity for uh, the capsid protein. So uh, when we talk about the magic ratio of capsid protein that is 
necessary and sufficient to completely package any RNA, it turns out, not coincidentally, that's the amount of protein that brings the same positive charge to the solution through the cationic uh, N-terminal tails of the capsid proteins, the same amount of charge as you have on the RNA. And so it suggests that electrostatics is, of course, the driving interaction for protein-RNA binding. Uh, that's the first step in the formation of the capsid. Mm -hmm. And by working first at higher pH and then at lower pH, we can separate these two steps in the, in the uh, formation, the co-self-assembly of the uh, infectious virus or the virus-like particle. Um, I reminded Steve Harrison uh, just before the talk that uh, when I went to visit my son and his family in Cambridge 10 years ago, uh, I thought I'd stop in and uh, talk to Steve about a crazy idea we had, namely to try to reconstitute an enveloped virus from purified components. It had never been done. It still hasn't been done. And uh, I blame him for not discouraging me in the sense that uh, he said, uh, uh, great, it would be interesting if you could do it, but it'll be hard to do. But at least you've picked perhaps the best virus to try, namely an alpha virus, uh, Synbis. And I don't have time to talk about why we picked it and uh, why I still think it's the best one to try to reconstitute. Um, uh, work by von Bonis von uh, Bunsdorf and Harrison in the 70s uh, had shown that you can nicely reconstitute the membrane protein of the virus in uh, liposomes. And in fact, uh, they will spontaneously hexagonally order uh, and exclude excess membrane and form uh, small liposomes about the size of the viral envelope uh, with close-packed uh, membrane proteins of the virus. A lot of work had shown that the cytoplasmic end of the transmembrane uh, glycoproteins of the virus uh, have uh, a strong interaction with uh, uh, a domain of the capsid protein. So uh, we thought, just form the naked nuclear capsid. In fact, that had been done for Synbis by the Wenglers in the 80s and Richard Kuhn and his group in the 90s with recombinant uh, capsid protein. In other words, we thought people have made the envelope, they've made the nuclear capsids from purified components, why can't you just combine them? I still don't know why you can't, but it seems you can't. Uh, it's a nice challenge for uh, people in the audience who don't have a better idea uh, to, to try this. Uh, we can make virus like particles, they look like enveloped uh, nucleic acids, but they're not infectious. So there's something about, it's almost certainly the membrane proteins that uh, uh, doesn't allow them to be functional when you process them the way you have to when you're working with purified components. Uh, after several years of failing to reconstitute the virus, uh, my student, uh, Adesi Aziz Golshani, uh, a really strong student. Uh, of course, I felt badly. Here's a PhD student with lots of hard work and great experiments, but no thesis. So we realized we had to retreat a little bit and to test the idea that maybe we're not handling the membrane proteins right. We thought, let's at least show that an in vitro reconstituted nucleocapsid, when put into a host cell that has been made to express the membrane proteins of the virus, that it's capable of budding out and becoming an infectious particle. Uh, and so uh, either by micropipette mm -hmm. injection or electroporation or even lipofectamine works for getting uh, reconstituted nucleic acids to be taken up by cells that we have uh, transformed to express the membrane proteins of the virus. We have to make certain we don't have the viral RNA inside the nucleic acid because we showed in separate experiments that that's a nice way to start an infection. You transfect the cells with the naked nucleic acids. So without the benefit of the membrane and the endocytotic pathway uh, 
for delivering the naked nucleocapsid to the cytoplasm, you just directly put reconstituted nucleocapsids into the cytoplasm, they will start an infection. In fact, it's very good evidence they bind directly to ribosomes and the viral RNA, which is positive sense RNA, it's messenger RNA, it's directly translated. And you start an infection and then you would see budding. So you wouldn't know whether the budding is because of the infection you started or the budding of the reconstituted nucleic acids that you put into the cell. So instead we, we uh, take out the structural genes of the viral genome and put in reporter genes, fluorescent protein uh, in this case. And uh, we find that when you put the nucleic acids into cells that are expressing the glycoproteins, you get, uh, we count how many infectious particles we get. They're not really infectious. When we lay them, when we take the supernatant from the uh, transfected cells and we lay it over naive cells, uh, we don't start an infection because we don't have the viral genome, but these particles, because they're wrapped uh, with functional membrane proteins, they do come into the naive cells and uh, the RNA is translated not to start an infection, but to give fluorescence because we have the EYFP gene included. Uh, so we just count fluorescent uh, cells. And uh, even if we just put in the uh, RNA, uh, we get some fluorescence, but no signal at all. The, the uh, control is to not have the membrane proteins in the cells that you're transfecting. So I do think, for all the reasons that it made sense 10 years ago to try to reconstitute an infectious enveloped virus. Uh, it's worth trying. Uh, Odyssey, when she wrote up her thesis, uh, handed it to me, and I noticed right away there was no chapter on her several years of work uh, that proved to be, quote, unsuccessful. And uh, I suggested to her she write that up as a chapter. In fact, it should be chapter two after the introduction. And, and she said, but it didn't work. So you did good experiments, and uh, that's the thing about science and the history of science. You do a good experiment, you report it. You don't know yet what you've learned from it, but uh, someday it'll be useful. So we still joke, she and I, about chapter two uh, and what it means. Uh, we can make non-infectious enveloped virus like particles. We first reconstitute uh, the uh, nucleic capsids using the capsid protein from the plant virus. We put any RNA we like inside. And because the outside surface of the uh, capsid is negative, we just add a little cationic lipid uh, to the, our usual formulation. We make up neutral, but a little bit of cationic lipid liposomes in the presence of the uh, uh, self-assembled capsids, and we each one of these is uh, a T equals 3 structure with whatever RNA or DNA oligos we like inside, uh, and it's wrapped by a lipid bilayer, uh, which can be functionalized for targeting and uptake by cells. Um, and we realized that uh, we want to start taking advantage, this is several years ago, uh, of a special property of positive sense viral RNA uh, genomes. Not just that the genome is directly translated as a messenger RNA, but that the first gene product is an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, namely an RNA replicase. You know that RNA isn't replicated. DNA is replicated. Uh, the only time several of you with colds, if you have certain kinds of viral infections, you do have RNA replication going on in you because the viral genome is being replicated, not using an enzyme it's borrowing from its host. There is no RNA replicase to borrow, so one of its genes has to be devoted to uh, the RNA replicase. Uh, so can you see that? I hope so. Um, this is the organization of uh, alpha viruses and many positive sense viral RNA uh, mm -hmm. genomes. There are, in the simplest cases, just two open reading frames. One codes for non-structural genes, namely uh, 
uh, a few uh, proteins related to RNA replication, and the others code for structural proteins. If it's a naked virus, it's basically just the capsid protein. If it's an enveloped virus, it's the uh, membrane proteins as well. Uh, the amazing thing about the replication strategy of the virus is that I mentioned the genome is directly translated. These viruses don't involve the nucleus of the host cell. It's one of the reasons they can have very few genes. You don't need complicated instructions for getting things into the nucleus and out of the nucleus. And the life cycle is very short. Uh, the capsid protects the genome until it's released to ribosomes. And uh, the first gene product, in fact, the translation of this molecule results only in translation of the first open reading frame. There's a stop codon. So you make the proteins for replicating this molecule. You make a large number of complementary strands. In fact, you make thousands of them from a single copy. And then through a reorganization of the replication proteins, and it includes some host cell cofactors, um, the replicases begin to act only on the minus strands, no longer on the plus strands. And so from the full length minus strand, now you make full length plus strands and you make uh, hundreds from each of these negative strands. So now you've got 100,000 copies of the viral genome. That allows you to make in principle 100,000 copies of the virus, uh, but you're lucky if you get uh, thousands, but that's still a lot when you think about the exponential growth of a life cycle uh, involving a few hours. Uh, um, not only do you get full length plus strands, you get replication of the second open reading frame. So now you get up to hundreds of thousands of copies of the messenger RNA for structural proteins. So in transcription, if you want uh, a lot of proteins in a hurry, you want to make lots of mRNAs, and then you want to translate them many times, but you never make hundreds of thousands of copies of mRNA. This is a viral uh, evolved strategy, and it's something we want to take advantage of to have high uh, protein expression levels in situ where we've targeted certain cells with the virus-like particles I'll describe in a moment. So this is basically the strategy we want to take advantage of. This uh, genome is too long to package into a single capsid. That's why I bothered to show you that. In fact, we know that this uh, molecule is packaged by three or four capsids. That doesn't give the same protection to the RNA. So we started looking for a positive sense RNA virus whose genome is significantly shorter. And uh, we, we found one in an insect virus, which I'll tell you about. I just want to show you in this larger slide, again, what the basic idea is. I just blew up uh, the first part of uh, the previous slide. We want to replace the structural genes of the virus by a gene of interest. And then uh, we will have RNA replication before we have translation of that gene. And that's how we uh, amplify the uh, expression level of that gene product. So I mentioned that we needed to go to an insect virus to find a short enough uh, viral genome to work with. We're using capsid protein from a plant virus. And uh, we're interested <coughs> in delivering genes to a, a mammalian host cell and we're often interested in delivering mammalian genes. So this is as hybrid a virus-like particle as you can imagine. I like to say we're taking the best components of the highly evolved strategies of viruses that have evolved to infect well uh, very different kinds of hosts. So let me just tell you the same story of RNA replication, because I think that's new enough to many of you, um, and its relationship to high protein expression levels for genes of interest. Here's the Nodomura virus. It has a two-molecule genome. 
the first molecule is, a, is basically the open reading frame coding for all the RNA replicase proteins. And the second molecule codes for the capsid protein. This virus comes as close as any I know to a two-gene virus. Another question we're interested in is how few genes can a virus have and still be a virus? It sounds like a silly riddle that you'd ask a kid, but I think it's uh, uh, an interesting question, even a deep question. I think the answer is two. You need a gene for the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase because no host cell will provide that, and you need a gene for the capsid protein. Nothing surprising about that conclusion. Uh, and in this case, the uh, two genes are on two molecules. Uh, you translate this first molecule and you make the replicase proteins, so you make lots of copies of it, and uh, you also make lots of copies of RNA2 because the replicase proteins bind to that RNA and amplify it, uh, and then its translation gives the capsid protein. So uh, what we did was to take the Motomura virus, replace its capsid protein gene by uh, a reporter gene, fluorescent protein, and we showed that in vitro reconstituted uh, particles, virus-like particles, uh, when transfected into mammalian cells lead to fluorescence. In other words, two important things happen. The capsid of plant virus protein, when it binds to the mammalian cell ribosome, still releases the RNA content, and the insect virus RNA replicase works in the mammalian cell. So th that was an important experiment. Uh, and uh, what we're starting to look at, now we're using luciferase as our reporter gene. Fluorescence is nice. You can see right away that you have a positive result. But luciferase is a much more quantitative way of assaying how much protein you're synthesizing. Of course, you can do Western blots and all sorts of things. We do all those things. Uh, and we find that we can either work with just the first molecule of the uh, insect virus genome, which has the replicase genes, and we can add a gene of interest to it, like luciferase, or we can work with both molecules where we leave molecule one alone, but we replace the uh, capsid protein gene with the gene of interest. And in both cases, we get a lot of amplification as measured by uh, luciferase assays. And so uh, we're working on a variety of problems where we use the <coughs> in vitro reconstituted virus-like particles to protect self-amplifying RNA for high levels of protein expression in targeted mammalian cells. Uh, I, I want to conclude with this slide. Uh, I, I became obsessed with thinking about viruses 10, 15 years ago, and a few years ago that obsession has focused on positive strand RNA viruses. Uh, occasionally at group meetings we have arguments since we have students working on different viruses. If you could be a virus, what virus would you be? Which is really a way of saying uh, there's one virus whose evolved replication strategy you think is especially elegant and uh, uh, beautiful. And I would surely want to be, I know this is personal information, but I, I would want to be a positive strand RNA virus. Uh, because then I, I, I understand things when they're simple. Uh, and uh, I could have as few as two genes. Uh, we're taking Notomura virus. It turns out it has snuck in third and fourth genes. They're puny little genes, a few hundred nucleotides. They code for really low molecular weight proteins. One is arguably important. It suppresses the RNA interference uh, defense mounted by host cells. The other has unknown function, but we're going to take out those two puny little genes and see how long we can uh, grow this virus. Uh, it's an interesting experiment in viral evolution also. Um, 
these uh, positive sense RNA viruses have introduced RNA replication to evolution. Uh, I've already emphasized they have the advantage of being directly translated by ribosomes, uh, having short, quick uh, viral <coughs> life cycles. We can engineer the viral genome to be a self-replicating molecule with uh, inserted genes of interest. And we can do this with RNA molecules that are short enough to be efficiently packaged into very sturdy um, virus-like particles, which can in turn be wrapped by lipid bilayers, or the capsid protein can be modified, functionalized to uh, bind to receptors and so on and so forth. Uh, I've already mentioned that I uh, started doing theory and viruses uh, 15 years ago with Avino and Ben Shaul. We had been doing theory together for 20 years before that. Yes. Um, so um, we have uh, shared theory students. Uh, is Walter here? No, Walter Singeral uh, spends half a year in Israel each of the last several years, as have the other theory students working on this project. Um, all the experiments, which is uh, what all the other students uh, in the group do, are done at UCLA uh, under the joint direction with my colleague Chuck Nobler. Uh, and we've been really lucky to have uh, some extraordinary students. I mentioned uh, Adesi Aziz Golshani. Um, uh, here are the names uh, of the students uh, above this line who have recently finished with us and the students who are currently working on these positive strand RNA uh, viruses, and we have some very good collaborators. Hope there's time for a few questions still. Thank you very much. Okay. Neil. Yeah, so a comment. I think the minimal number of genes for a virus is, is one for the capsid. If it hits high with, with another virus... So, okay, so uh, Neil's point is that uh, all you need is a capsid protein. There are many, quote, viruses that have uh, one gene for capsid protein. But as he says, they are not, uh, they are parasitic on other viruses. So I don't consider them proper viruses. Uh, they're called satellite viruses. And they use the RNA-dependent RNA replicase of a virus that has already infected the cell. But you got the idea. Yes. Well, originally we, we reduced it more than that, but then we asked uh, how much do we have to reduce it in order to get the interactions between proteins strong enough to form these uh, irreversibly yeah, uh, stable question, capsules. How does, how does this reflect in vivo uh, conditions? Yeah, yeah uh, can't really answer that question. Uh, <coughs> certainly, uh, this is a plant virus uh, whose capsid protein we're using, uh, you have a lot of variation in pH in any cell uh, from uh, very acidic environments, uh, low pH is a 5 to a uh, neutral pH, and that's similarly true in a plant cell. And so, frankly, I don't know, I, I can't give a good answer to the question uh, uh, you're asking because it's, it's not clear how the in vitro conditions correspond to the in vivo ones. Uh, no, then you get a mess because the capsid proteins are interacting strongly with each other before they've had a chance to bind to RNA and you have a big globular aggregate of uh, badly formed capsids. You have to have a regulatory mechanism to the mechanism to from... That's right. But does it assemble the Absolutely, yes. Uh, the life cycle takes place like that of almost all positive strand RNA viruses, of which there are many. The whole life cycle is in the cytoplasm. How did the new viruses avoid pollination? Well, they spend a lot of time. Uh, 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 well, they often don't, okay? But uh, they obviously do. And um, in the cases of RNA viruses where it's been shown that the capsids 
whether they're naked viruses or enveloped viruses who have lost their envelope uh, getting into the cytoplasm. Uh, when the uh, capsid binds directly to a ribosome, the RNA is protected as it's being translated. So in that sense, you have a chance to circumvent RNA interference mechanisms and uh, uh, RNAs in general. We are trying to show, in fact, uh, with in vitro experiments that uh, it is possible to translate the RNA content of an intact capsid, uh, <coughs> what we're doing in vitro translation, where we add the reconstituted uh, nuclear capsids to ribosomes. Yes. About Janer. So you said that Janer was the first to develop uh, a vaccine. And actually, this is not accurate. Uh, he was himself was vaccinated uh, when he was eight years old. Uh, and that, then he learned about it. And it happened many years before uh, the, mm -hmm. the uh, system of uh, vaccination of human beings was developed many years before genre and they called violation. Yes, that's right. And yes. it was uh, done by uh, taking the uh, virus, mm -hmm. well, they didn't know that this yes, virus, right. from people, right. not from cows. Yes. And, mm -hmm. and this was very dangerous. Yes. It was subcutaneous. That's right. Uh, mm -hmm. It was made, I think, for girls in uh, Ukraine. And then they were... Uh, Exactly, and it was Lady Montague, a British noble woman who had spent some time in the Middle East, and she came back to England and encouraged vaccination. So yeah, I didn't uh, tell the full story. Thanks very much. My wife is a historian and even a, a historian of uh, science, which is why I appreciate the history of science as much as I do. And if she were here, she would have pointed this out. So thank you. <laughs> Okay. Um. Bill, I missed, I missed one point because I was worrying about the air conditioning in the room. Mm -hmm. uh, at the end, you were talking about a virus that has two components. Uh, it, two it, components? Uh, it, it, it's a two-molecule genome. Symbis, the alpha viruses, has those two open reading yeah, frames yeah. in the same molecule. Those two molecules interact in order to be packaged together? That's a good question. I don't think, in, in the case of uh, HIV, where you have two copies of the genome package, uh, there's a lot of uh, good evidence that there's intermolecular secondary tertiary structure associated with the viral genomes that gets a pair of genomes packaged together. In the case of many molecule genomes where you have two or more molecules packaged in the same uh, capsid, I don't think uh, there's an answer to your question. I don't think it's been explored. Uh, in those cases, sometimes the capsid proteins have signals uh, influenza is a spectacular example. You have an eight molecule genome. You have one copy of each of those molecules. No other uh, nucleic acid packaged. Uh, these are uh, outstanding, meaning uh, unsolved uh, problems in okay. physical chemistry, if you like. Okay, in the interest of time, next thing.